You're listening to the Reversing Climate Change podcast by the team at Nori, the carbon removal marketplace. This is a show about the innovators and entrepreneurs developing solutions to climate change. Hello, and welcome to the Reversing Climate Change podcast. My name is Christoph Jospe, here with my co-host, Ross Kenyon, and producer Paul. We are in the Nori office. If you like the show, if you like what we're doing, please subscribe, please share this episode, please rate it, leave us a review. If you have ideas around new guests or you don't agree with what we have to say, you can always email us at hello at nori.com. Ross, how about you introduce our guest? Yes, and in a small point of order, if you do review us and do choose to give us that gift, that it really helps more than you might think. If you give us a nice rating and a review, and you're, if you have it on your iPhone, you're listening in the podcast app that comes with Apple, if you do it there, if you do it on iTunes, it's the same place. It helps a lot. So thank you. And thanks for introducing uh, me, Christoph. Calling it a gift makes it sound like we're doing a telethon right now. <laughs> yeah, I, I should do that. I imagine myself in seersucker. For <laughs> some reason, I have a straw hat. This is like old school <laughs> politician stuff. Benji, pardon the train wreck here, but we're, <laughs> we're, we're, we're going to give it a go. I think we're nervous because he's the youngest guest we've had on the podcast. That's right. We're, we're just trying to be cool. We probably shouldn't announce that when we have the oldest guest, but maybe so. Uh, Benji Backer, founder and president of the American Conservation Coalition and also a student at UW, University of Washington. Benji, thanks for being here. We saw you speak recently. Wanted to hear more about what is the American Conservation Coalition and just generally... What the audience wants to know is what do conservatives have to say about the environment and what is an organization like this doing? Yeah, so I'm a 21-year-old college student and felt pretty disenfranchised by the Republican Party on the environment. And I've been active in conservative politics since age 10, was knocking doors at age 10, which was a weird sight for most people who answered their doors uh, for a political (laughs) candidate. But there I was, uh, four foot five and all. And so I talked to a lot of other young people who identified as conservative, who cared a lot about the environment, and they felt like they needed a voice and for the Republican Party to do more on the environment because, again, they felt frustrated. So we launched an organization about two years ago, and it's a national organization called the American Conservation Coalition. We're on 125 college campuses nationwide, and we also have a pretty big presence in Congress pushing legislators to do more on the environment who otherwise wouldn't. And overall, it really does bring people together because they realize that conservatives do care about the environment. They just want to have something within their own value set. And the study I always point to is to the University of Michigan study that showed that climate change skeptics who tend to be more conservative are actually more eco-friendly in their day-to-day lives than climate change activists and people who really care about climate change. And the University of Michigan, and I believe it was Cornell, partnered on that study, and that's what it overwhelmingly showed. And That's just to say that people who maybe aren't as engaged in these conversations do still care. It's just a matter of getting something to them and having them become active so things do happen on a national and and state and local level. Yes, that's a very important way to, to go about it. And I think a lot of the disagreement may just be the way that people talk about this mm-hmm. or present these issues, because as your website singles out, I think sportsmen and women who are involved in hunting and fishing and living in the countryside where they're actually interacting with nature in quite a regular productive capacity, they have environmental instincts that are in many ways more honed than people who live in the city and just visit nature. And uh, so what has failed? How come they haven't been activated in the correct way recently? I feel like you're the only person I've heard talk about this, except for maybe when we had Todd Myers on or yeah. there's a couple others. but Right. Yeah. I mean, that's a really good point that a lot of times conservatives or people who don't seem like they care about the environment or are more out of the conversation are the ones who live in the environment and they know firsthand how important it is to protect it and preserve it and interact with it so they can have it for future generations or for their farm or whatever it might be. And I think why those voices have been lost is because most of the voices like you pointed to are coming from urban areas who don't understand the issues of people who live out in nature, don't understand the importance of the rights of their property. They don't understand the issues that they deal with every day. And they're like, oh, if we just pass this policy, it's just that easy. you know. And they're living up in the 20th floor of some apartment building, and they have no idea how the environment actually works. So while the motives are good, it's the knowledge is just not there. And they're not acknowledging the people who are out in nature who are living off of that and are affected strongly by the decisions that are made in terms of environmental policy. So 
I think when you want to look at returning to a better dialogue on the environment, you have to understand that, yes, urban areas matter in those discussions, but so do the rural areas, if not just as much more. And uh, you got to take that into account and the people in those areas into account, because as we've talked about, they care about it just as much as anyone. Yeah, we've been to a lot of farming conferences and and oftentimes farmers and environmentalists do not make good neighbors or, or they, they just haven't figured it out. There are cases where they have, like when we had Trey Hill on the podcast, who's a farmer in the Nori pilot out of Maryland. He has been working with environmentalists and considers himself one, but I think a lot of times it, their perception, and this may be false or in some cases may be true, of people from the city coming in and wagging their fingers at farmers and saying, you and your father and your grandfather have all farmed this land wrong and you're harming the planet and, and hurting everyone. And uh, that isn't always the best way to be persuasive. I don't know if that always works. <laughs> can, can we try to define something here? Uh, what is environmentalism uh, as a definition? And what should environmentalism actually be? Yeah, so that's a really good question. I was at a conference here in Washington State where I asked the conservative audience who considered themselves environmentalists just generally. And almost every hand went up, which I actually was kind of surprised by. And then what I was trying to get at was in today's terms. So then I asked and clarified, do you guys consider yourself an environmentalist in today's terms? Which, again, I thought would have been the question the first time. But no one raised their hands, as you might not be surprised by. And it's because environmentalism should be just about caring about the environment You might have different approaches as to how you want to go about that, but you just care about the environment. You want to protect it. You would go above and beyond to protect the environment, whether that be through your own actions or political or whatever it is. But instead, it's been co-opted as a completely political term that when you hear environmentalism, you hear Al Gore, you hear like massive climate change reforms like the Paris Accords and the Green New Deal. And a lot of people are turned away by those three things and other words that are symbolized. So then they think of environmentalism as this politically divisive term that they don't even want to come close to associate with. And then as a result, a lot of people end up going to the exact opposite and, you know, trying to be anti-environmentalist, even though they care about the environment. So it's turned into this kind of crazy notion. And again, it just should be about caring about the environment. But unfortunately, it just isn't anymore. And there's plenty of reasons for that. Christoph sent this up so well. I want to do the same thing with conservatism because I think people, Hmm. I'm going to spiel out. I'll let you have the first whack at it, but. uh, (laughs) (laughs) You can spiel out. (laughs) Oh, I definitely will. I think when people think about uh, conservatism, they typically think of Tucker Carlson or Bill O'Reilly just Mm. yelling at people Mm. on TV. It's like there's like a couple minutes to to yell or turn their mic off. And then two minutes hate, right? Two minutes of hate. Yeah. I think it's more than that usually. Yeah. I've also seen some that are, (laughs) are longer than that, but. There's a rich conservative tradition out there, too, that is not well represented. Mm -hmm. It it might be the format. It might just be political discourse in the country at large. It might be both. But just broadly, what is conservatism? In in 2019, that's a very loaded and difficult question. And I think it has been difficult, especially in the last three or four years. If you do the math, there's like something that's correlated with that. But uh, someone who's correlated with that. I mean... When it comes to conservatism, what I think of and why I was drawn to it as a young person, it was limited government, not like no government where like you were just having all out anarchy, but limited government and like common sense solutions where you balanced local, state and national decisions. You had a positive discourse. You took into account the environment, the economy and all different parts of American culture into decision making. And it's about equal opportunity for all, um, you know, giving people opportunities to succeed in what I think is still the greatest country in the world. And I think that we have strayed as conservatives from that. It's turned more into a hostile, anti-left dialogue and oftentimes doesn't represent limited government ideals, even pro-economic ideals. And I think, unfortunately, conservatism, there's really no good answer to what conservatism is right now because it's so hard to define. I, I don't think someone like Tucker Carlson spewing like a a hateful two minutes on Fox News would have been tolerated by conservatives 10 years ago. And it's just kind of been a slow and steady way down, in my opinion. And and like when I was drawn to it, it was 2008, 2010, 2012, Mitt Romney. That reminds me of when I think this was in 2000. 
nine. My background is I ran the College Republicans at Arizona State. Ooh, did you know that, listeners? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Paul's talked about that elsewhere, but here it comes for you now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I had gone out to D.C. for a conference, a week-long conference, and I remember, I think it was hosted by Young America's Foundation, and I remember talking to one of the other students who was there about it and saying, like, I really wish, like, conservatism was better represented in the public sphere by like smarter, nicer people. Like it's just all Ann Coulter and Rush Limbaugh right now. So I actually like 10 years ago, I think we were in nearly the same position, just uh, maybe to a different degree, but I was making the exact same complaint 10 years ago. See, I I think that it's changed though, because I think that those talking heads are still there, but that's always kind of how it's been. There's always been kind of radical talking heads in both sides throughout history. But I think it's the, it's the mass amount of them where like the people who people used to listen to who are more sane voices aren't even listened to anymore in the conservative Mm -hmm. movement. And even more so leaders within the Republican Party that are elected are more like the talking heads that are radical than they were before. So I would say there were those voices that were propped up more than they probably should have been. But I think on both sides, that's always been the case. I just feel like now more than ever, those voices are propped up more. I don't know. So there's a video of you on the internet Uh uh, with Van Jones. Oh, that's a good one. (laughs) Explaining what you do. And he's like, wait, so why aren't you on our side? Which is, which is interesting. So it's this presumption that environmentalism is, or wanting to do something about climate change is only, Mm -hmm something that the left can even talk about. Like if you were vote right of center, you're not allowed. You can't come mm-hmm. to the party. But what you're saying is, no, actually, we can and we should and our ideals contribute to potentially a more efficient way of solving this problem that everyone cares about. Right. So <laughs> Benji with the one word answer. Yes, I agree. <laughs> I, I just what, 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 for me, when I learned that Paul was part of college Republicans, I was like, game on. Like, I've always voted left of center, but I want to be Mm -hmm. part of a company that has ideals that think differently for me because I think the diversity of thought contributes to a better outcome. Right. Our team is is quite good at that. I feel like we even had a meeting recently where I'm like, people have strong opinions on this team, but I want people to be able to change their mind uh, when convinced. I don't want everyone who just agrees with each other because you're also just weaker. It's like, the, the thing that I always come back to is all of these schools of thoughts and intellectual traditions are a bit like a kaleidoscope. And you can say conservatism has these insights to offer in these blind spots. And you can flip and say libertarianism has these ones. And you can do the same thing with basically every school of thought I've ever read. Yeah. It, and I've, I've read lots. Th- there's something there that is useful and applicable if you use it in the right way. They're, they're also wrong about stuff. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's important. Okay, I'm going to spiel out, okay? No, it's okay. Minor monologue. Alice under taking a picture. It wasn't (laughs) candid. I threw a little sign. What I like about conservatism, and correct me if I'm wrong, Benji, I'm I'm thinking back to, I'm imagining a nicer, the best of the intellectual tradition that is conservatism. I'm thinking, like, you go read Edmund Burke, you read Robert Nisbet, uh, some of William F. Buckley's stuff, Michael Oakeshott, the Scottish Enlightenment. I like David Hume a lot. But uh, what I like about conservatism is that it's a recognition of the limitation of of humanity. So uh, being able to redesign social systems by fiat and impose them is a great risk. And so for conservatives, the thing they love pointing to until the USSR existed was the French Revolution, where you had this like ideal society that was redesigned out of the human mind, and we were going to transform everything all at once, and it was going to work out. Literally everything, even their calendar and how they kept time. I know. I love that, like (laughs) like, uh, Brumaire and all the weird weird months (laughs) they created. Yeah, that... That, to me, is the conservative nightmare. And, of course, it ended with Napoleon and and, uh, decades of war and all because just the the kings uh, were quite exploitative. And I wonder what might have happened, like, if their transition was a little gentler, maybe closer to to England's. I don't know. This is getting a little off track. But that's what I like about conservatism is a a sort of, like, default skepticism about humanity's ability to redesign their social institutions and to be cautious. So that's what I associate with the best of conservatism with those authors that I, I mentioned but I don't really see that. Normally, it just seems kind of mean. Mm-hmm. Do, is this is this your experience? Are there people that are contemporary that people should be reading if they want really smart conservatives that like, where do I look? 
Yeah, well, I think like in terms of the policy world, like an Arthur Brooks does a really good job of being a compassionate conservative. He's at uh, AI, right? Yeah, American I think he just recently Institute. stepped down as oh. president just because he was not really enjoying the whole political discourse. And also he'd been doing it for a while. He, he took a new role. I just yeah. listened to a podcast interview with him. Yeah, he today. did take a new role yeah. somewhere, uh, but he just published a book. I haven't read it yet, but he ju- it just was released recently. It was like the it's Healing... Uh, Healing America or something. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I think I saw that. Yeah, and someone like that, I think that's more common than you might assume. I think most people who identify as conservative still hold those beliefs like you're talking about as, and as I talked about to some degree. They're just kind of temporarily following something that's different and new. What I like to talk about is if you turn off TV and you turn off social media and you just go to a coffee shop or you talk to your neighbor, you realize that these people like haven't changed. Like they're not evil all suddenly because they supported Trump or Clinton or whatever or Bernie or they're, they're still the same people. And we actually end up agreeing on way more than we think we do. But because they are represented. So if you're conservative, you're represented by Trump or if you're liberal, you're represented by AOC because those people represent your beliefs that that automatically means you're that hostile or you're that, you know, mean, like you were talking about when most people within those movements, I think, can find common ground despite some of the differences. There's this awesome Saturday morning breakfast cereal webcomic that I always like to share in moments like that, where he he depicts when you think you're talking to someone else on the internet who holds some beliefs that are opposed to yours. Most of the time you're talking to like a normal, reasonable person, but you're characterizing them in your head as like exactly like you're saying, like they're the most vicious, most ungracious possible stereotype of who you're disagreeing with. And so that's how you argue with them and it goes back and forth and ultimately it's really this is where this discourse really breaks down on the internet is it's mostly just nice reasonable people trying to talk to each other and just not being able to do that and if i may jump in with my i don't know expected typical ross knows where i'm going i I grant it (laughs) just make it quick because we only like the 15th time it's come up uh Yeah. Well, Benji, are you familiar with Jonathan Haidt and the righteous mind and moral foundations theory? Yeah, just not like super deeply, but... Yeah. So we've talked about this before on the podcast many, many times, but like ultimately people just have certain values. Mm -hmm. And if you speak to them and you speak their language in respecting those values, then it's much easier to have a good dialogue. And that's what people do most of the time. It's just that these like hot button issues tend not to do that. Yeah, and actually, something I was talking about the uh, just yesterday is people who are logical are actually, even in politics today, are more common than people who are kind of mean and rude, but they don't get the airtime because it doesn't drive clicks. And so it's really hard for someone, like somebody that I really look up to is Mike Gallagher. He's a congressman from Wisconsin, and he is like... He really understands young people, but he's conservative, and he I think he's pretty good on most issues, and he's willing to work with both sides. But even though he's young and he gets it, and he, most people in the United States would probably have a, a massive amount of respect for him if they knew who he was, he doesn't get the airtime because he doesn't say mean things. And so it goes back to... Like those people know how to talk to people in their minds and where they're at and their value set and they know how to, you know, show compassion and they know how to associate with them. But those types of people aren't pushed to the top of the pedestal in American politics right now to a degree that at least I haven't seen in my lifetime, albeit short. But like that's just something that I think is part of the process and part of the problem that there are a lot of people out there who believe in common ground and believe in their value sets combining with other people's, but it's just not popular to, to the mass culture. Uh, yeah, I, I think you're spot on. Uh, I, I think part of it is sort of a, like a technological determinism or, or thereabouts that uh, the way that media is marketed and monetized sort of encourages clickbait. Man, I, I yeah, don't really like vice very much but holy cow like they i always read the comments i'm like god this article is just like pushing the buttons of everyone involved i'm like this is what sells ads these days yep. and it's the same for all sorts of platforms and i think it's really harmful and i think we're now living in the repercussions mm-hmm. of this new media world let's move on to specifics though benji say we grant that you're not a terrible person for being a conservative Let's say we do. Oh. <laughs> uh, a hypothetical. A hypothetical. Yeah, How, I'm, you're in the good graces, but you can fall out of them at any moment. You be very careful. You've Benji. been warned. I am walking on eggshells currently in this <laughs> office. There are eggshells on the ground. Can you hear the fear in his voice? 
Uh, <laughs> what might be a conservative approach to climate change or, or how can you persuade conservatives that there is a way that they can care about this and not betray their values or throw capitalism under the bus or where does one start with that? Yeah. So I think first I'll answer the second part of the question because I think you've got to get conservatives involved before you even talk about some sort of policy. And I think a lot of people, unfortunately, are just jumping to a policy and then they're like, oh, wait, where's my audience? I'm conservative and I care about climate, but where's my audience? Like, I, they're not there. So there's some people who are on board with climate change reforms within the conservative movement, and it is a growing number, but not enough to make it a massive wave yet. We're getting there. So how do you get them involved? Well, first of all, I actually think, despite really disliking the Green New Deal, I think it's forced Republicans and conservatives to get on board. And I think that's a benefit of the Green New Deal is that it's so against what we believe as conservatives that it's pushed us to say, if not for the environment, at least politically, we've got to get some sort of alternative done. And so now you're seeing new voices who might be surprising in the climate discussion. So it shouldn't take that much, but that's partially how people are getting involved. The next way is talking about some basic ways as to how capitalism and the market can play a role in climate change reform. The easiest way to look at it is you can talk about tangible things like little technologies that everyone's starting to use that are reducing emissions or energy usage. Um, you look at like even just something that's easy for people to understand, like the Nest thermostat, which you can control from your phone and reduce your energy usage, and just simple things like that to get people engaged to say, okay, like there's a technology that, you know, was spurred by innovation in the market that's helping reduce emissions or the electric car or hybrids or whatever it might be. That's that's something that came from market demand and it's reducing emissions and it's improving technology and that's the future. And how the United States led in emissions reduction in 2017, we don't have of a massive government policy, but a lot of it came from innovations in technology or in transportation or whatnot. So making it accessible for people to realize that those two things, innovation and the markets, go hand in hand with the environment is something that a lot of people don't understand. And that the more innovation and the more technology and the more the market grows for the better from consumer demand, the more emissions are going to be reduced. And that has to be a part of a government policy if there's going to be one. So that's an easy way to bring conservatives in and that capitalism can play a huge role in opening up the market for more innovations and more technologies to continue reducing emissions. And again, that's that's the first step, I think, in bringing people into the discussion who otherwise haven't been. So I buy all that. And, you know, to go back to 2017, a major reason because that emissions went down is because coal plants weren't economic because the cost of natural gas exactly. became so cheap. And fracking played a major role in reducing those costs. And whether that's energy independence or actually we're just going to become an exporter of mm -hmm. uh, fossil fuels, who knows is to be determined. But we're talking about emission reductions. Mm -hmm. That only goes so far. Right. What it doesn't acknowledge is that the greatest market failure of all time is the failure to price carbon as an externality to say if we emit co2 it accumulates in the atmosphere that causes the greenhouse effect that warms the planet that causes climate change we're here on the reversing climate change podcast so we obviously think about well how do we make this problem just go away mm -hmm. and is, whether is that a market failure though it's a market failure well <laughs> I'm laying some like easy softballs here. It is it is a market failure to not price in that I'm adding this problem and I'm not figuring out how to reduce reverse that problem, right? Or is it uh, more like a tragedy of the commons problem? And who creates those? That's debatable. Yeah, I mean, that's a fair debate. Yeah, don't derail the guy too much. Let him <laughs> let him continue. We can we can fair, talk terminology. Fair debate. Later. My my point is, we're not going to get there with nests. Like nests are cool. I'll install a nest because it's going to reduce my energy footprint and it'll save me money. So I'd be silly not to. Right. Right. And game on. Whatever political color you are, you should support that. But CO2 is still going into the atmosphere because, as I just noted, like we're building more natural gas plants. So we're not capturing the CO2 there. That CO2 is going up. So what's the free market approach or something that is palatable to the right of center audience that can actually solve this 
whether it's tragedy of the commons or market failure to price in carbon, what's the right approach here? Yeah, so I guess what I was trying to get at there is that's how you bring in people to the discussion and show how tangibly the market and their personal decisions as people can work hand in hand with climate change. Because they see it as something that's like, I'm just a person and the, the only solution is this huge government policy and it's so above my head and I don't know how I can relate to it. So talking about like solutions that they personally can relate with as well as like direct effects of climate change that affect them tangibly, those are the ways to get people into the discussion. So that's what I was going towards. But I totally agree that you've got to you've got to talk about the bigger problem too. So that's the next step. I didn't want to be talking for the like for 15 minutes straight. So the second step for that is we talked about this a little bit before, but there are different ways to reduce emissions in terms of climate change, like carbon capture and storage and an increase in clean energy, which I think the market will show as something that is more competitive than a lot of conservatives even assume, especially if you allow nuclear and hydropower to be a part of that mix. And I think those two things together can make a massive impact. At the same time, I think a lot of people, so knowing that even that's market-based and the free market can play a role in that and technology with carbon capture and storage can play a major role in that, there still is the duty of other countries to start working on their emissions. Because If we reduced all of our emissions today, it wouldn't really matter if India and China continue to to raise their emissions and and other other countries too, especially developing ones will probably be more of an impact uh, going forward too. So that's just something that you have to think about too. And that provides an opportunity for us to start leading and for us to show other countries how we can do it without completely like shutting down an economy like a lot of people think could happen with a climate change reform. So it gives us an opportunity to lead, but we also have to keep that in the back of our minds when we're having the discussion that it's not just up to us to fix this issue. And I think a lot of times, especially in the United States, we just kind of put it all on us and we're like, oh, you know, we're the worst and, you know, this is this is our problem. It's it's everyone's problem. And we've got to showcase to the world how markets and a government policy can work hand in hand to solve this problem, in my opinion. I just want it to work. I hate when things sound good on bumper stickers. It can yeah. be shortened that much. I, I feel like whenever it can, these questions are quite complicated. Yeah. I think a lot of this policy should be probably kept pretty simple. Yeah. So one of the common criticisms that actually we'll be having someone on the show, uh, I believe the following week to answer this common rebuttal that they've heard a lot, but that the Green New Deal tries to do too much and try to do too much all at once. And this makes it more fragile because it's more complex. But there are also perhaps good reasons to do it that way too, both for the symbolic purposes and also because maybe people need uh, the flexibility to move to different places and they don't need employer provided health insurance. Maybe that's a dependency on that as a hindrance to transitioning to a new green economy. So I think it's an area that is ripe for discussion and conservatives have a part to play. In fact, they have to have a part Mm -hmm. to play in it, right? Like, is anything even going to happen if they don't? Probably not. So then what is the plan for the energy transition? The plan for the energy transition, at least to pair it back what I'm hearing from you, Benji, is there are technologies that can reduce the accumulation of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, whether that's capturing CO2 at power plants or producing sources of power generation that don't emit CO2. And one of the points on your website is actually to have a voluntary carbon market. Mm -hmm. You talk about carbon offsets. That's obviously quite interesting to Nori because we're developing carbon removal certificates, which is removal only. And actually, we have quibbles with what offsets even mean. And there's a lot of, we don't even need to go there, but just take my word for it that carbon removal is better because it actually represents real activity as opposed to an avoided emission. Anyway, gauntlet's thrown, still waiting for someone to come on and talk about that. But I think the the free market approach is to say, like, let's self-regulate. If there is or isn't a carbon tax, like if you're putting this carbon into the atmosphere, you can say, you know what, I know this matters to you. I'm going to take care of it. Of course, I was kind of thinking like when you were talking, I was like, Benji sounds a little bit like a Democrat. He's saying, you know, we got to lead so that China and India will follow. But then I was trying to put myself in the shoes of a Republican and be like, what are you talking about? Like, why should the U.S. have to do this if these other countries aren't doing it? Yeah. And you're saying, no, we should do it first because we can be a leader. Yeah. So I, I guess even though I'm not, look at me like I am the crankiest Republican who doesn't want to do anything on climate policy and convince me from a conservative viewpoint why I should care about this and my ideals. 
Yeah. So I think, first of all, if you look at conservatives and what they care about, it's national security, it's jobs, it's you know military, all those things are affected by climate change. But they don't really know that yet because no one's tried to reach them in that register. No one's talked to them about how most military leaders have come out saying that climate change is a threat that we need to work you know, towards a solution on. Most people haven't reached them talking about the jobs that are going to be affected. And most people haven't reached them on the issues that they've probably seen firsthand. I mean, if you live in Colorado, which outside of Denver is a pretty conservative state, and the the Colorado River has dried up, if you don't talk to them about that and things that they've lived and seen, you're not going to reach them either. So So it's those types of ways that you can reach conservatives. And then talk about how as it, a lot of times the talking point against working on climate change is all, all these other countries are doing it, so why should we? Conservatives have a lot of pride in the United States and us leading the world and doing things first and, and having people follow. So you can, you can take it in that way and say, yeah, those countries aren't doing enough. But why don't we show them how it's done? Why don't we do it so our economy continues to boom by allowing innovations and carbon capture and you know carbon credit certificates or whatever it might be and, and continue with clean energy development and all the jobs that, that creates? That's such an easy sell to people, but you have to try to realize where they're coming from and where they're coming from isn't the Green New Deal. And so if you try to reach them with the Green New Deal, it's not going to work. So that's what people don't understand. I mean, it's called the, the New Deal. Which is uh, right. <laughs> like you're using this sort of like callback to uh, like the golden age. Exactly. And yeah, it's probably not going to appeal to right of center people too much. No, but that's all they've heard since the early 2000s. I mean, that's just kind of an accumulation of the climate movement. I, I think it's one of the problems I see is that it's often presented as it's this or nothing. Right. And if it's presented that way, then it makes total sense that, one, you're going to get people on the left who are furious that people on the right don't support it and don't Mm -hmm. want to do something about climate change. And then it also makes sense that people on the right are going to say, well, no, we don't we don't like that particular solution. Is there a better way to do it that might achieve the goals that we share in common? Maybe. Mm So, yeah, I think the right's suspicious that the policy goals of of the left are sort of all included in the Green New Deal outline. Which it kind of is. (laughs) Yeah, which is, I mean, we come back to this all the time. It's Naomi Klein's This Changes Everything. This is like the shock doctrine, but for the left, like it's their chance to get all the policy outcomes they haven't been able to get before. And uh, I think that loses them a lot of uh, trust from people who are right of center. I mean, even look here in Washington state. I mean, I moved here in 2016 before before the election and the revenue neutral carbon tax was opposed by people who were left of center because they didn't like where the money went. And so then conservatives in the state who were actually a lot of them were supportive of the carbon tax, which nationally most conservatives would not be for even a revenue neutral carbon tax, but they were here and it failed because they didn't like where the money went. And so to them, it was like, well, then what's it about? What is this really about then? Is it about the environment? Because we're going to get the like a very similar result by passing this through a bipartisan type of you know compromise, or is it about where the money is going? And that was shown at least here to people who are conservative, and they're like, "Why would I even get on board with this if I I tried and it didn't even work because of not increasing the size of government?" The thing that was like the most sad about the way that happened in 2016 here was that. One of the like main purposes behind doing it in that way as revenue neutral was to try to set like a template that yeah. could be used in other states that weren't so far left leaning as Washington is. Yeah. How are you going to get legislation like that passed in the Midwest unless you come up with a way to move that forward? So partially the reason why we haven't had climate and, and environmental results, and there are plenty of other environmental issues we're talking about, but one of the reasons is because conservatives haven't put together their own plan. But I think a large part of it is because liberal environmentalists haven't been willing to try and work with people who are right of center to find something in the middle that is about the environment. And it's turned a lot of people away. Um, And I think your point is exactly right. To that end, have you been able to find a way to make inroads with people on the other side of the aisle and like work together on some sort of common cause in your organization? Yeah. So the Nature Conservancy and Audubon have been great partners of ours, but they're moderately left of center. And I think usually like on a campaign like 
I-732 revenue neutral carbon tax in Washington, they were, you know, willing to work on that type of compromise. And I think they are nationally and in almost every state that they have a presence in. So I think that those organizations do a really good job of realizing. But that's partially because a lot of their membership is conservative, like Audubon up to 50%, they say is is conservative between 40 and 50%. That's a that's a big chunk that they represent. Whereas like the ones that dominate the discussion, the Sierra Clubs, World Wildlife Fund, those types of groups don't want to work on a compromise. And I, I know the Sierra Club president and CEO pretty well. He's a really nice guy. We have a good relationship. But in terms of like finding partnership opportunities, they're just they just aren't there because they're not willing to compromise at least even a little bit on where they are. I really like the Nature Conservancy's pragmatism and using property rights Me too. to achieve those outcomes. It's like impossible to even object to, except I've seen objections for stuff like their oil leases. So <laughs> stuff like that is more controversial, but like the basics of using property rights in a way, I feel like if you were conservative and you wanted to oppose it, how would you even do it? I feel like if they want to do that on their land, then I, who With who cares? private money. Right. With private money. What is the common ground with the left, Benji? Where should people be looking? How should we be uh, crossing the aisle and working on these things? So I think when you look at, personally at ACC, we like to focus more on the non-climate issues first when we're talk, trying to talk with both sides. I know to a lot of people that sounds kind of alarming because you're like, well, the climate issue is the most important one. But there are so many other environmental issues worth talking about, like national park backlog, which almost everyone would agree we need to fund our national parks. Like 95% of Americans support national parks. So that's something, but it's also not getting done. So what are those 5% all about? I don't know. There's always 5%. I'm anti-national parks. There's always 5% somewhere, right? <laughs> if you ask everyone, if they oppose whatever, I'm sure at least. Yes. I'm kind of surprised it's as small as 5%. Yeah, there's always 5%. It's like, wow, I, I don't know who you are or where you are, but I probably never see you. And I, yeah, where do you live? I don't know. Um, it's like the, the old like Simpsons joke of old man yells at cloud. Yep. It's like Grandpa Simpson just yelling. Yeah. Ah, those darn national parks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's always our, their fault. Our greatest idea, I'm told, by, <laughs> by Ken Burns. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, so, so it's just like issues like that where we haven't been able to come together, even though it should be really obvious, and we actually do agree, that I think we need to start out at because those issues do need to be tackled. So National Parks, the Endangered Species Act hasn't been affected, but we need to have a policy there. But everyone agrees that we need to have a policy for endangered species. I mean, it's things like that where I feel like that could be the catalyst to future conversations about like climate change. And I think that that can happen pretty quickly. I mean, that sounds like a far off thing, but I think that can happen pretty quickly if we actually start talking about it and making that mainstream. But if you want to, if you want to jump right to climate, which a lot of people do, then you have to start with the notion that the person who might be skeptical or not as involved or doesn't think it's as serious that they're still wanting the same things as you. They still want clean air. They still want clean water. They still want to preserve the environment for their kids and the future generations. So if you start there and you're able to actually know that you have the same goals in mind, it's easier to have a conversation. I think most of the time on climate, people start the conversation thinking they're at polar opposite ends of the spectrum and just doesn't go anywhere because of that. And so as cliche as it sounds, you have to realize that there's at least common ground in the goals of cleaning up the air, cleaning up the water and making the world a better place. And then you can go into the policies knowing that at the very least you have the same common goals. But I think most people go into the, those conversations thinking that you don't. And then you can start having the policy discussions. Starting with the assumption that the person you're speaking with is a decent person has gone deeply out of fashion. Yeah, you would think I wouldn't have to say that, right? I think independently of whether or not they are actually a decent person, they could be quite bad. If your goal is to persuade them, I never understand if, if people imagine that they're just going to conquer the <laughs> other side and like th these like cultural moves in the country are cyclical, right? Like, yeah. like, like you're going to have it come back the other way and you know, whatever uh, new policies or powers you give to the president or the legislature is going to be used against you when the cycle turns and when the culture turns against you too. I think people kind of are like, short-term thinkers in that way and uh, it's dangerous it is and most people a lot of people don't think that they're thinking that way but they are and then there's just if you're if you're trying to convince somebody or have a decent conversation you start with hostility it's like you think common sense would be like that's not gonna work <laughs> I would challenge the listeners to go out there and find someone that you might not see eye to eye with and try to have an egalitarian discussion, even if their views are truly horrendous. At the very least, you might get a good story out of it and learn yeah. something. I was just going to put you on the spot and cite the intellectual Turing test, which seems super relevant here. Oh, yeah. Are you familiar with this, Benji? We're just throwing so many things at you. I know. That it's, it's the ideological Turing test. 
Oh yeah, what did you oh, say? Oh, the ideological. Did you say intellectual. Oh, thanks for correct, uh, okay. correcting me there. <laughs> uh, ideological Turing test. But uh, I'm queuing up your question, Ross. Oh yeah, we're gonna have a final question. Ideological Turing test is, I think it's from Brian Kaplan at uh, mm-hmm. George Mason, the uh, economist. Basically, you should be able to represent the ideas of someone you disagree with so well that someone wouldn't know whether you actually held that belief or not. Mm-hmm. I think people are quite bad at this mm-hmm. and actually i've seen evidence that conservatives are better at this than than liberals and knowing like what arguments liberals are going to make mm-hmm. whereas like could your average progressive make a good faith argument for what a conservative could or would say yeah i i think that you're right that conservatives probably do have a slightly better understanding of that but i do think that that's something that's lacking too because if you don't understand the other person's argument and where they're coming from then you really can't have a good dialogue that's productive. And I feel like I've, I've got a pretty good understanding recently in the past few years of where the other side is coming from. And it's helped me kind of shape my beliefs. And I think that that's something that a lot of people are missing. Like when I was younger, I was just so caught up in, I was actually in the tea party. I actually, I, I would sit down at the dinner table. My sisters believed in climate change and I didn't believe in climate change. And I was like screaming at them like, ah, it's not real. Like, stop, you know, making it up. And then, you know, that was me at like 12. But I was like so consumed and I never really tried to listen to the other like person side. I've never like changed my beliefs on conservatism because I've listened to people talk about climate change, but I've been more open to it. And I think that that's what happens when you are able to understand the other side's argument. You have a better understanding of the way that they look at life. You have a better understanding of how to approach issues that they can maybe collaborate with you on, at least some people. And it's a way better opportunity to get things done, even if you don't agree. And I think it's really like, if you're listening to this, if you say abortion or immigration or whatever, and you can't make an argument for the other side, then you probably don't know enough about what the other side's standing for to have a cohesive debate on it. And I think it's really important to know on the issues that you care about how the other side could argue so you're prepared and also just so you can understand where they're coming from. Absolutely. I think that's a, a very good exercise. And the, the older I've gotten, the more I've read, the wider I've read, the more I realize I'm kind of an idiot <laughs> and like how much there is to know. I'm like, oh, God, we are I'm, all pretty much idiots. I'm, I'm learning stuff all the time. <laughs> and uh, the world is just so complex. And then also, if you introduce that people can legitimately disagree over how to rank values, then you're opening up a whole nother <laughs> section of <laughs> things. The world is hard, basically, and it, it helps better. Even if for practical Machiavellian, if you want to out-argue someone, it's usually better to listen to them and understand them. Yep. But also you might learn something, or you might not. Maybe you'll just uh, burn your empathy reserves to the, <laughs> to the ground. Okay, so last question that relates to this. We ask this question sometimes, and I think we should ask it more often, Benji. Uh, who do you think is the smartest person who disagrees with you? Ooh. I know. This is, this that is, is a, a loaded question. I honestly think someone like... Van Jones that I've interacted with is the smartest person that I disagree with him on probably most things to an extreme degree. But he, I really respect because his whole goal, despite being a pretty far, I mean, he's he's fairly far left in terms of his views, not like that, that has a negative connotation now, but he's fairly liberal in his views. But his whole goal is to bring people together, even despite that, and he still holds his views, you know, at bay. And I and I really respect him for that because in today's world, that's something that isn't popular. And he's just, dis- despite that, gone out and done what he you know could to bring people together. Right now, it's around criminal justice, and so I think that's pretty cool. And it's probably not the most like traditional answer of like a politician, but he leads with bringing people together despite his liberal views and huge disagreements that he and I would have. And I think it's pretty effective. That's cool. Van Jones, we're coming for you now. <laughs> Out of the list. You can say Benji Backer as well. <laughs> uh, well, Benji, thanks for being here. Thanks yeah. for letting us put you in the hot seat. I think it's uh, it's fun. Listeners, I hope you, you like it. I think a lot of our guests tend to be more progressive. So hopefully this was stimulating. If you like it or if you don't, feel free to reach out to us at hello at nori.com. And a reminder to please rate and review the show if you, if you like it. And if you don't, you can skip that part. <laughs> <laughs> and just to throw it back to you, Benji, if someone's listening and they want to get more involved with your organization, what can they do? Yeah, so our website is acc.eco. So instead of .com, it's .eco, acc.eco. And then we're at acc underscore national on Twitter. And then I'm at Benji Backer on Twitter. Um, there's plenty of ways to get involved in our website. And uh, we'd love to love to have more people involved.
Is it primarily for conservatives? Is there is there room for people who are left of center to come together and work on issues there? For sure, especially on specific projects that we do. So like becoming a member of ACC and staying you know in contact with us for certain like advocacy things we're doing around like national park backlog or some important campaign. Really easy to get involvement from both sides of the aisle. So you know we're happy to have people from all political stripes work with us. We moved on kind of quickly from that, but I think uh, working on some of those things where agreement is so high would probably go a long way to building some trust between yeah. the groups. And it feels, does anyone trust each other? Like if no. you're if you're not inside of the political clique, I think it's impossible to even talk these days. Yeah. yeah. And it's worth noting, like the best thing you can do to be prepared for climate change is actually be more neighborly because- the closer we are, the more tight knit we are as a community, the better prepared we are, the more resilient we are to actually solve this existential threat. And also, like, it's not an us versus them. It's not this side versus that side. Like, we're right. all we're all on team reversing climate change. Yeah. The world hasn't figured it out yet, but one day we will. <laughs> Good I luck think it's sooner us, than yeah. we think, actually. Yeah. I hope so. I hope I hope. uh I'm always hesitant to use the phrase. I almost did the, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> Don't do it, Ross. You Rewatch. literally just did. I know. But you just used it. Rewatched recently the Ken Burns Vietnam series. And you're like, God, they said that for like 15 years. <laughs> they never, they never, <laughs> they never saw it. Okay. Well, thanks for again, Benji, for being here. That was super fun. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.